a police chief, and it's my pleasure to be here with you tonight to discuss our uh, 2022 RIPA report, which stands for Racial Identity Profiling Act. We'll learn more about that momentarily. But first, I just wanted to do some introductions. I've already introduced myself. Uh, with me here tonight, to my right, I have Assistant Chief Troy Dunlap, who oversees our Administration Bureau. I have uh, Captain Pete Hernandez, who oversees our Spec Ops Bureau. And I also have Lieutenant Andrew Belante, did a lot of work on this report and will be presenting the report to us. So I'll just go over a, a quick kind of agenda or sequence of events and what we're going to do this evening. First off, I want to hear from you. So thank you again for coming. Uh, but we are going to do a brief presentation. Okay, so we're going to briefly present uh, the report to you. The report for those who are online is available uh, to um, to follow along with at uh, CoverCityPD.org. So you can find it there if you'd like to follow along those who are online. Also, it is available in the back for those who, who are here tonight. So again, Lieutenant Belante is going to kind of kick this evening off by just doing a uh, overview of uh, the report and what it entails. And we're going to get into question, answer, discussion, dialogue. Again, that's that's where you all come in, and we want to we want to hear what your thoughts are. I want to uh, just let you know that we may not have all the answers for you this evening. This is really complicated stuff, especially when you start diving into data. Um, but we will certainly do our best to answer your questions if you have them. And if we can't answer them, uh, we will uh, get back to you, hope via email, and, and continue the discussion in that way. For those of you who are online this evening, please feel free to submit a question using the chat um, uh, function, and we will be answering them uh, along with uh, the folks who are here in person. So with, uh, without further ado, I'm going to uh, kick it over to Lieutenant Andrew Belante, who's going to give a brief presentation on the report. Thank you. Thank you, Chief. Hello, everybody. Thank you for coming in tonight. I'm Lieutenant Andrew Belante. I uh, currently work our professional standards unit, and I'm going to give you guys about a 15-minute presentation about uh, RIPA. So what is the Racial Identity Profiling Act, also known as RIPA? In 2015, the California legislature passed Assembly Bill 953, which requires state and local law enforcement agencies to collect data regarding stops of any individual detained by a law enforcement officer in the state of California. By law, this data shall be collected and reported to the California Department of Justice on an annual basis. The data that is collected and reported to the DOJ on every detention made by the Culver City Police Department includes the following. The date, time, and duration of the detention, the location of the detention, the perceived race or ethnicity of the person being detained, perceived gender of the person detained, the perceived age of the person detained, the reason for the stop, if the stop was made in response to a radio call for service, and lastly, the results of the detention. This data is provided to the State Ripper Board, which is overseen by the Department of Justice. This board reviews and analyzes stop data collected from law enforcement agencies every year and produces an annual report that provides an analysis of the data, as well as recommendations on best practices that can be used to eliminate racial and identity profiling and to improve diversity and racial sensitivity in law enforcement. CCPD is considered a way for sized agency, which is a department less than 333 officers. For the law, an agency of our size was not legally required to collect and report RIPA data until April 1st of this year. However, in the spirit of accountability and transparency, CCPD took a proactive role in getting ahead of the curve and began early collection and reporting of RIPA data beginning in October of 2020. Knowing that there would be challenges associating with collecting and reporting a voluminous amount of RIPA data, CCPD began collecting the data two and a half early and a half years early to identify training as well as technological issues associated with the collection of data and to ensure these practices were implemented prior to the legal collection and reporting date of April 1st of this year. When the department began collecting RIPA data, one of the first issues that was identified was a lack of modern day technology. 
In the first year of RIPA collection, the department was using paper forms that were completed and entered manually. We identified that this process was extremely labor intensive and not an efficient practice. In January of 2022, the department upgraded its current police reporting system, also known as Mark 43, to integrate the entry of RIPA data. This transition improved efficiency by decreasing the amount of staff time that was being used to input and manage RIPA data. In this transition period, we identified some training issues associated with information sharing within the system, specifically regarding arrest data. When identifying these training and technological issues, the department has taken a proactive approach in implementing a process to ensure the collection, reporting, and submitting of RIPA data is being done accurately. The department's professional standards unit conducts weekly audits to ensure RIPA forms are being completed and submitted by the officers during field contacts that require stop data to be collected. This process includes the review of the involved officer's police reports and body worn camera footage, as well as a review of the corresponding RIPA form to ensure the data was being completed and submitted accurately. Additionally, our patrol supervisors receive bi weekly recaps of the overall stop data to ensure that our officers are policing in a professional and unbiased manner not targeting a certain segment of the community and are acting within departmental policy. And lastly, in the spirit of transparency, we report all of our department's RIPA data to the public on our social media outlets, as well as on our quarterly report, which can be accessed on the department website. Next slide, please. According to the 2021 U.S. Census, Culver City is 5.1 square miles with a nighttime population of just under 40,000. 47% of the population is white, 18% is Hispanic, 18% is Asian, and about 9% is Black. Over the past several years, Culver City has seen substantial growth throughout the city. Dark corporations, which employ thousands of employees, such as Amazon, Apple, TikTok, and Sony, have all established large-scale operations in the city. Additionally, there are many retail shopping centers across the city, including a Costco and the Westfield Mall, which attract a large number of consumers from throughout the Los Angeles region. Clover City is adjacent to several state highways, including the 405, the SR90, and Interstate 10, and is estimated that the daytime population in Clover City exceeds 300,000 people. Next slide, please. When analyzing RIPA data, it is important to recognize that the demographics during daytime hours within the city can significantly dif differentiate from the nighttime population reported on the U.S. Census report. It should be noted that the vast majority of individuals that are contacted by CCPD during either traffic stops or radio calls for service reside in jurisdictions outside of Culver City. Although it is impossible to obtain an exact accounting of demographics, in a geographical area at any given time, the department employed several methods to obtain an estimate of citywide demographics related to motorists in Culver City. First, we evaluated five regions of Los Angeles that border Culver City. These regions consist of Ladera Heights to the south, Mar Vista to the west, Palms to the north, and Baldwin Village and West Adams to the east. The bottom chart on this slide reflects the demographics in each of those respective zip codes. Additionally, we conducted a random four week sample of all 20 red light cameras that were proportionally deployed across the city. Red light cameras capture digital images of vehicles that run red lights, as well as the driver of the vehicle. These images are taken by digital technology, which eliminates any inference of human bias. In the four week sample, a total of 2,865 red light camera violations were captured. The top chart on this slide is a breakdown of the demographics of the drivers identified committing red light traffic violations through the department's red light camera system during this sample period. Next slide, please. One of the benchmarking techniques recommended by the RIPA Advisory Board in their 2020 report was for police agencies to examine the role of local violent crime in analyzing racial disparities in police contact. Violent crime is defined by the California Penal Code as murder, voluntary manslaughter, mayhem, rape, robbery, kidnapping, jacking, and aggravated assault. In 2022, there were 283 of these violent crimes reported to CCPD. Out of these 283 crimes, 
There were 452 suspect descriptions provided to CCPD by independent victims and real witnesses, which included the race, gender, and approximate ages of the involved suspects. To prevent, deter, and solve crime, CCPD frequently reviews crime trends and often directs resources to areas throughout the city that are experiencing increases in violent crime. Those suspect descriptions provided by witnesses and victims are imperfect measures of the true criminal population. These, these descriptions provide an estimate of the relative participation of different gender, age, and ethnic groups committing violent crimes in Culver City and is an important factor to be taken into consideration when analyzing the data. Chart on the right, portion of this slide reflects the demographics of the suspects involved in violent crimes in Culver City in 2022. The descriptions provided by victims and their witnesses, approximately 50% of the subjects involved in violent crimes were described as being black subjects, 25% were described as being Hispanic subjects, 16% were described as being white subjects, and 7% of the time the race of the offender was unknown. Next slide, please. Now we're going to review the stop data for the year 2022. Before reviewing the data, we'd like to discuss the difference between a police initiated detention versus a community generated detention, as there, big, as, as there is a big distinction between the two. Police initiated detention is when an officer participates in a self initiated activity, such as a traffic or pedestrian stop. This activity is typically conducted when officers are enforcing traffic laws. Can also be conducted when officers observe suspected criminal activity, which leads to the detention of an individual. These types of detentions accounted for about 85% of CCPD's total detentions in 2022. Community generated detentions occur when an individual is detained as a result of officers responding to a radio call for service. An example could be a radio call of a suspicious subject, a crime that just occurred or a radio call of a suspect who is being detained by loss prevention officers for theft. These types of detentions accounted for about 15% of CCPD's total detentions in 2022. In total, CCPD detained 7,127 individuals during a total of 6,811 incidents. This includes both police and community generated contacts. You may ask why the number of individuals detained is higher than the number of incidents. That is because in some incidents, more than one individual is detained. An example would be a robbery that just occurred with three involved suspects, and the officers locate all three suspects. This is one incident where three separate individuals were detained. Now we're going to take a deeper look into different specific categories of RIPA data that is reported to the DOJ. Next slide, please. This slide reflects the data associated with detentions by perceived race. This data was divided into two sections, which include the data associated with individuals being detained during police initiated contacts and the data so associated with individuals detained as a result of being the source of a radio call for service. With respect, with respect to detentions related to police initiated contacts, the data is reflected in the chart on the left side of the screen. Out of the 6,099 individuals detained during police initiated contacts, Hispanic subjects accounted for approximately 34% of those detentions, followed by white subjects at 28%, and black subjects who accounted for 26% of the total detentions associated with police initiated contacts. With respect to detentions related to community generated detentions or radio calls for service, it is reflected in the chart to the right side of the screen. Out of the 1,028 individuals detained in response to radio calls for service, black subjects were the highest demographic detained and accounted for approximately 36% of those detentions by Hispanic subjects at 31% and white subjects who accounted for 29% of the total detentions associated with radio calls for service. Next slide, please. This slide reflects the data associated with detentions by perceived age. Teal covered graphs represent the number of individuals detained by age brackets during police initiated detention, and the dark blue colored graphs represent the number of individuals detained by age brackets during community generated detentions. Out of a total of 7,127 detentions, 
include both police initiated and community generated detentions. The top received age ranges of people detained were number one, individuals aged between 26 and 40 years old, which accounted for approximately 51% of total detentions. Number two, individuals aged between 18 and 25 years old. And number three, individuals aged between 41 and 55 years old, which each accounted for about 23% of total detentions. In 2022, a total of 56 juveniles were detained, which accounted for less than 1% of the department's total detentions. Next slide, please. The reason for the stop refers to the primary reason the officer initiated the stop of an individual. Top reasons for a stop and order were traffic violations associated with traffic stops. That accounted for approximately 81% of all detentions, followed by radio calls for service, which accounted for about 14% of total detentions, and reasonable suspicion, or when officers observed suspected criminal activity, which accounted for about 3.5% of total detentions. Next slide, please. The result of stop refers to the results of what occurred after the ripple stop was completed. As pre previously stated, track and traffic enforcement accounted for approximately 81% of total detentions. These detentions, in these detentions, approximately 52% of the time, the driver was issued a citation for a vehicle code violation. Approximately 32% of the time, the driver was issued a warning. And approximately 6% of the time, the detention resulted in an arrest. These arrests consisted of both custodial arrest, which is, a, which is when the subject was booked at the Culver City Jail Facility, and also field site and releases, which is where a citation was issued to an individual uh, who was in possession of a valid identification com who committed a misdemeanor crime, and that arrest did not warrant the person being booked into our jail facility. Next slide, please. This slide re reflects the demographics of subjects arrested by the Culver City Police Department in 2022. In 2022, CCPD made a total of 1,438 arrests. It should be noted that 1,283, or approximately 90% of subjects arrested in 2022, did not reside in Culver City. The chart to the left reflects the demographics and number of subjects arrested in response to a radio call for service. Arrests that were community generated accounted for approximately 69% of the Culver City Police Department's total arrests made in 2022. Black subjects accounted for 36% of arrests resulting from radio calls, followed by Hispanic subjects who accounted for 34% of those arrests, and white subjects who accounted for 25% of community generated arrests. I chart to the right. Flex the demographics and number of subjects arrested from police initiated contacts, such as traffic stops or officer observations of suspected criminal activity. Arrests made through self initiated activity accounted for 31% of CCPD's total arrests made in 2022. Hispanic subjects accounted for 45% of those arrests made through police initiated contacts, followed by white subjects who accounted for 31% of self initiated arrests. And then black subjects who accounted for 92 arrests, or approximately 21% of the subjects arrested from police initiated contacts. Next slide, please. This last slide is an overview of how CCPD's RIPA data compares to several other demographic factors that are commonly used to develop analysis regarding bias based policing. When it came to our overall RIPA data, which includes both police initiated contacts and calls for service, Hispanic subjects were the perceived race that had the highest number of total detentions with 2,414 detentions, followed by white subjects with 2,023 detentions and black subjects with 1,962 total detentions. As previously stated, the Culver City Police Department uses several benchmarking measures to ensure that the department's RIPA data is consistent with the demographics the estimated 300,000 people that reside, work, and visit Culver City on a daily basis, as well as with our arrest and crime data. As you can see from this slide, our look data is consistent with the totality of these benchmarking measures. We believe the data provided in this presentation affirms the professionalism of our organization. We will continue to examine our RIPA data on a regular basis to ensure that every contact is legally justified. All individuals are treated fairly and equally, 
and will improve diversity in our communities by maintaining the highest level of public safety service. Thank you for listening to the presentation, and I will now turn it over to Chief Sims to answer any questions. Thank you. Thank you, Lieutenant Perante. Thank you. Yeah. A couple quick things, and then we'll get into questions. Uh, first, uh, I just want to reiterate kind of what Lieutenant Perante said at the end of his presentation, is, and that is that um, our goal, our job, is to provide a safe and welcoming Hoover City community for all. Um, for everybody that, that lives, visits, works, and comes to Culver City. We utilize this data, and we've been collecting it since 2020, uh, uh, well before we were required to do so by the state. Um, and uh, since then, we have um, constantly analyzed the data, looked at the data, and utilized the data to help guide their policies, procedures, and the expectations of our officers, and we will continue to do that. We are committed to doing that at the Culver City Police Department. I believe, again, it makes us better. We are uh, dedicated to providing professional police services to the community of Culver City. An example of this is, um, again, we started collecting this data in 2020, and very, very early on, we decided to make a change. We, at the time, Chief Sid implemented in February of 2021, several months after we started collecting RIPA data, decided to implement a directive to curb the amount of traffic stops that we were making as an organization for very low level traffic violations. We chose to instead focus on uh, hazardous traffic violations when we are conducting um, traffic enforcement activities as a police department. We thought that that was a better use of our time and uh, that the uh, enforcement of those low level traffic violations, windows, uh, things of that nature, registration violations, uh, was having a desperate impact on uh, folks of color. And we saw that. So we made a change. And since then, there has been a significant impact on uh, the amount of traffic stops that we make as an organization. In fact, since then, there's been a 61% decrease in the amount of traffic stops that we make as a police department. And that's a lot. Uh, additionally, uh, we have seen a 38% decrease in overall arrests. 2021 when we implemented the directive to now. And 38%. And so it's had a significant impact on uh, the activities that our, that our officers are doing on a day-to-day -day basis. That doesn't mean that we are not working hard to keep this community safe. It just means that we are refocusing our patrol efforts um, and doing different things. Again, focusing on hazardous moving violations. There's a lot of traffic moving through Culver City throughout the day, I think as we all can attest to. Um, and also working hard to be more strategic and directed with our enforcement efforts. If, we're, if we see an issue in the neighborhood, a catalytic converter issue, a trend, robbery trend in another neighborhood, we're working hard to put our resources there. If, or if we're having issues with safety, after uh, school and schools are being let out, and we're doing hard, uh, uh, we're working hard to put our resources there um, to have a more directed impact on community safety. So I'll stop there. Again, we want to hear from you. So um, if we have a question, please just raise your hand. We're going to walk around with the microphone so that please use the microphone so the folks that are uh, online can hear the question as well. Okay, so we have we have one right over here. Thank you. Um, so I, I look at this uh, graphic that you have up here on the screen, and I notice that, and I, I, I see part of your point, um, when you compare the RIPA data to um, the demographics of Culver City, it looks pretty bad. It looks like you guys, you know, 9% of our, of our population, uh, resident population are black, and, and your 
<clears throat> stopping, you know, 27% of your stops are, 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 black, are black people. Um, and, and, and that looks bad, but you're saying, well, you know, the people that are driving our streets are, um, <clears throat> uh, you can see in the red light violations, the bordering city demographics, those, those percentages are actually higher. So then it, it looks, you know, like maybe we're not doing such, such a bad job. Um, but to, to me, that's, that's not telling the story that maybe you think it is. It's, it's, it's telling me that we're mostly policing people that are, that are not living in our community, people that are, are uh, working here, people that are coming here to eat at our restaurants, you know, um, people that might not live here, but they go to school here, their kids go to school here. Mm -hmm. um, and that strikes me as very problematic, especially considering that the vast majority of violent crime um, is inflicted on, on from people that you know, people that you live with, people that in your family, um, uh, people in that could be your neighbor, people that, that you know that you see regularly. Um, so to me, that's such a mismatch between the um, the, the RIPA data and your arrests and what actually would be the, the the violent crime in our in our city, which would be committed by a demographic that looks much more like the lower right corner pie chart. Um, I, I, a couple more things I want to say, which is that one is that. Yeah, can I address that? Yeah, please. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for, for your comment. And uh, I really appreciate it. Um, you make good points. Um, I would say, you know, I mentioned it in the beginning. Uh, this is not an exact science and we are not um, purporting that it is. This is an estimation. Uh, we took again in, related to the red light camera data. Four weeks throughout the year of 2022 in three different months. Um, and looked at who was cited for those violations, and, and then from there we got these numbers. Um, I think it's relevant to the conversation because, at the very least, it gives us a better idea because it's very hard to measure who's in Culver City during the day. We know what the nighttime population looks like, but we also know that our nighttime population is not the community of Culver City. The community of Culver City is much more than just who sleeps here at night. It's all of the other communities that we have here on the screen as well. And it's the folks that come here, go to West LA College, go to the mall, frequent our downtown businesses, and so forth. It's everyone that comes and drives through Culver City. And so we believe that this red light data is at the very least relevant to the conversation, if not a better measure of what the community of Culver City looks like. To your point of who's committing violent crime in Culver City, we actually know what that demographic looks like. And in fact, 90% of the people who commit crime, violent crime in Culver City don't live in Culver City. I mean, that's we know that. reported though, right? That's, we know that. That's through who? Yes. Oh, please report. Yes, of course. Of course. Yes. Thank you. And I'm sure there is a percentage of crimes that go unreported all the time, every year. It, um, and those are happening in the homes. Yes. Yes. Thank you. Um, so please, what's your next uh, question? So I, I noticed that this, so this doesn't cover use of force and doesn't cover searches, which are covered in, so the state of California analyzed the data that you provide to them and they have their own statistics on Culver City and they, they run reg statistical regression analysis. And what they found is that, so this is, so looking at the entire state of California, black individuals were stopped, uh, sorry, um, I'll, I'll start with use of force. So in Culver City, the odds of CCP, the officers using force during a stop, were nearly twice as high for black individuals com compared to white individuals. On um, searches, um, statewide police are more likely to search black folks than white folks by 0.4 percentage points. LAPD is worse than that, 1.6 percentage points. CCPD is even worse, 5.3 percentage points, more likely to search black folks than white folks. And that's more than 10 times higher than the statewide number. And this is despite in your numbers finding less evidence of contraband on the black folks that you're searching. So in other words, you, 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 if you search a black person, you're less likely to find um, anything than when you search a white person, but you're searching way more black people than white people. After, and this is after you stop them. I'm not saying out of the whole population. I'm saying of the people you stop. So these, the population numbers don't even factor into this. And this is all after you made the change. This is all after you made that, that traffic stop change. Yeah. And so what, what, the state, what the state is saying, is that um, there, are, there are ways to fix this. They have very clear recommendations. They say, stop consent searches and stop pretextual stops. They also say, 
state cops out of traffic enforcement. You guys don't have the power to decide that. Um, but the first two things you do, you can put those in your policies. Yeah. Um, so I, I, I'm asking you to commit to commit tonight. Will you change your policies to end pretextual stops and consent searches against the best practice recommended by the state of California or, or police departments like this that have a problem with that, that their data says have a problem? And if, if not that, what actions do you think could possibly re reverse this essentially racist pattern that was revealed in the data that you reported to the state of California? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, thank you for your questions. And let me just start off by saying um, the numbers that we have are different than the numbers that you're purporting. And, 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 I, and I don't, I'm not going to get into a back and forth at all. That's not the purpose of this um, and, and try to crunch numbers. So down. just to clarify, you gave numbers to the state. Yeah, they ran an analysis, and these are these are the state's numbers. Right, so the they're, they're output of their of their analysis. Yeah, the state which is a statistical regression that, that you guys didn't do. Oh no, I understand, and and we're very familiar with the state's report. What I'm saying is they're different than what we have. What you're saying tonight. So what I would like to do is get together with you um, in next week, perhaps, to compare numbers and have more of a conversation about this, um, because again, it's not it's not about getting into a back and forth tonight. Numbers are different than yours. That's okay. I just want to talk about where you got them from. And, and certainly, as I said before, we are committed to taking into account these numbers. We take them very seriously. Well, one last follow up, and I know there are a lot of people here. Yeah. Just um, given that you know about the state's report, why didn't you include their numbers in your report? State's numbers are the numbers that we report to the state. No, they're not. They're, they run an analysis, and they have they have tables of odds ratios and coefficients that yeah. would be very useful for the city, the city of Culver City to see. And, and you said you're familiar with the report, but none of that information is in here. Yeah, I appreciate it. Thank you. So we can discuss it all more next week. In terms of committee, um, we're committed to doing all of the things that I said previously. We've proven that we're committed to taking these numbers seriously and making changes when we believe that Right changes are necessary for our organization. We'll continue to do that. Thank you. Oh. <laughs> My name is uh, Larry Laughlin. I'm uh, a resident here for 40 years. I worked as a policeman, LAPD, Rampart Division. Excuse me. Um, I would estimate that 99% of the time when uh, we would go to stop a vehicle, we would have no idea race, the gender of the driver. We know that a vehicle committed some violation. Am I, am I on the... Uh, and um, we take appropriate action. If it turned out to be a, a white person, a black person, or a Latino, uh, so be it. I mean, uh, we don't know. We we don't we and I'm I, I'm sure the police in this city are in the same uh, arena, the same situation. They don't know they're stopping. Ninety nine percent of the time, I would estimate. I'm very uh, unhappy that we no longer are enforcing minor violations like. You mentioned because uh, a lot of times they lead to much major crimes. And the other thing I wonder is exactly how do you identify a person? Uh, you using the word Hispanic. I use the word Latino. I happen to be married to a female from El Salvador. And uh, I don't know if you'd say Latino or Hispanic, but uh, I mean, do you go by looks? Do you go by name? 
And, and the same, I think, is true to a great extent uh, of Black people. I mean, uh, um, it, it's really sometimes uh, hard to determine, and I don't expect the police to be experts in that area. So anyway, uh, those are my questions. Thank you, sir. Appreciate your points and um, your question um, to how do we identify uh, folks and categorize them as required by WIPA. Uh, if you if you collected the um, uh, if you have a copy of the WIPA report, in that report there's a sample of of WIPA form that our officers fill out every time they make a detention, and the. Um, give you an idea of what it is that the officers have to do every time they, they make one of these detentions. Um, but the, as far as the ripple rules go and how we're supposed to and how we do our best, because again, it's not an exact science to identify someone. And again, these rules are coming from the state. We did not make this up is to just use our best judgment. We don't ask, we use our best judgment based on the, what we see and what we perceive. Again, it's perceived race. So certainly there is an, uh, um, a margin of error. Absolutely. It's not an exact science, but those are the rules that, that we were given uh, by the Ripple Board, so we do our best. Yeah, and we do have um, accountability measure, measures in place uh, to ensure not only that our folks are um, doing the forms and reporting that they're supposed to be doing, but also we have all of our stops are, are recorded in video, so we do have the ability to go in and ensure that um, with some quality control that, in fact, we agree with the perceived race. It's, again, just to ensure that we're all uh, doing what we're supposed to do for the, for the ripple rules. Thank you. Next question. Yes. Uh, how you doing? Um, I've been a resident here for 28 years. My mom's been here this whole time. And uh, during that time, early in the mid, late 90s, early 2000s, uh, police, I feel like the police um, disparity when it came to pulling over blacks or Hispanics versus other was bad and not in favor of black folks. Uh, There's a lot of pullovers for a little reason. I was a part of that. My mother was a part of that. And so there's really no kind of running away from that. Uh, when I was older and old enough to drive, there was certain, there were certain officers that would pull over you over, especially late night, for little to nothing, which I think is why you went to dealing with that um, change in regards to the small infractions there, because that would be the excuse. Uh, coming from somebody who lived it, uh, that would be the excuse as to why you pull over. Um, so I can I can attest to that being a part of that, living that. And um, but I will say I, I moved out in 2006, moved back in in my uh, my my security business here, in 2000 uh, recently in 2022. And uh, I've noticed that you guys have done a better job, much better um, in how you guys go about pulling people over, you deciding to pull over, even the faces that you have in the force. Uh, I see much more Hispanic. I see much more black. I see much more Asian, just around their uh, representation of the community around. Um, now, is it perfect? No, is is it could it be better? Obviously, yes. Are there disparities still that need to be worked on? I'm sure, yes. But I have noticed the improvement. Um, it's definitely better than it was in the early 2000s. It was terrible, and that was the facts. That's just what it was. Uh, you know, when you looked around, you were driving around in Culver City. Mind you, I lived here. I lived it right over there in Fox Hills. Uh, you saw mostly Hispanic and black being pulled over. That's just what it was, period. And you, when you were driving around as a Hispanic or a black person, I can speak to that. I knew I had many friends here of those cultural backgrounds, including ourselves, my family. You had to be careful. You knew the city was infamous for that during those times. But now, uh, 
Now, I can't speak for everybody. I can only speak for myself and the people around me, but it's better. It's not what it was. Whatever you guys are working on is working. Is it, is it done? No, I know it's not. Where the, where the gentleman here was talking about with the statistics, those are great points. Uh, but the simple fact that you guys are here talking about it uh, and trying to make an improvement is good, you know? And I feel like we can run that. Uh, and, you know, the, the gentleman here that was speaking about those stats, he can come, we can have conversations and we can improve. That's how improvements are made is through conversation, dedication, you know, discipline and consistency. Right? So if you, if we come in and we, you know, take those steps, uh, you know, you guys are giving us an open forum, whereas before there, that didn't exist, I feel like change can be made and. You guys or we us as a community can be an example for other, you know, police forces around, you know, here, uh, California, even maybe United States or whatever, you know, you hear a lot of bad stuff going on with the police and uh, conversations like these need to happen more as opposed to just one side against the other. Uh, it, you know, it's a, it, I feel like change doesn't happen just with, you know, hate and, uh, you know, just bad energy, you know, change happens with communication and conversation, uh, middle ground, uh, understanding. And so if, if you guys, you know, as the police force are willing to, um, you know, buy that, and, you know, in terms of, you know, talking, you know, and, uh, you know, uh, accountability and working through these things, I feel like as a community, and, you know, we do our part and we, you know, like the gentleman here, like me and whoever else come and give our side and we come to a middle ground for, for, you know, a better city, you know? So, yeah. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much. Um, your experiences are, are very different than mine. Your ex and, and your thoughts are incredibly valuable to this conversation. And, and I thank you for that, for, for, for giving us that tonight. Um, Absolutely, policing has changed. Policing was very different in the 60s compared to the 80s, compared to the 2000s. Policing in Culver City is very different now than just five years ago. Um, and, um, we're sitting here tonight, part of that, and we are committed to that. Um, it starts with um, us working together. We're better together. I got to get you on the chief's advisory panel, man. That was great stuff. That was great stuff. I'm convinced it's not too bad either. So, um, no, I agree with everything you said. Um, we're not done. You know, I think it's it's an incumbent upon me as a chief, as us as the police department, to understand the community's expectations of us, and then we make that change to meet those expectations. And we're, we're working hard every day to do that. And we're going to continue to do that. Yeah, my promise. I'm sorry. Oh, hi, I'm Deborah Weinrock, and I want to thank you for putting all of you for putting on this wonderful presentation and for including us. And I really want to thank the mayor and, and the council members and former mayor for being here. Um, it, it's a lot of extra support that we all need. And I think we all would agree that each of us would agree that our number one the most important thing in Culver City to each of us, the number one thing is our safety, our public safety. Um, and as far as the statistics, I'd like to ask the gentleman and, and ask you, Chief, in due course, if those statistics could be made available to us um, to look at and, and to compare, because these are very new statistics that um, many of us, including myself, are are not familiar with. Let's just leave it at that. You know, when uh, Mr. Laughlin was speaking, the former LAPD officer, he talked about something I, I just want to address briefly. Um, because of my profession, I went along with LAPD, CHPD, other um, jurisdictional police departments on ride-alongs many, many, many times. Um, and we never once stopped somebody because of what the person looked like. 
each time there had to be a reason that could be articulated as to why the officer stopped a particular vehicle. Um, and, um, and so at that point, based on my limited experience, person's race, appearance, gender, whatever was not a factor. Um, I do have one quick question, and that is because this is such a sensitive and important topic, if a resident has concerns as we go forward, and in light of all the material you've presented tonight, how can these concerns be addressed? What is the best vehicle for contacting you and, and for getting questions answered? Yes, thank you, thank you Deborah. Um, first off, uh, thank you for your comments. If uh, somebody has a concern, just a general concern related to our police department, um, they uh, are, um, I would encourage them to, to call the watch commander. We always have someone uh, working. It's a 24-7, 365 operation. And so uh, that number can be found on our website, but it's 310-253-6202, and they can voice that concern to the watch commander. And the watch commander is going to be, at, at the very least, a supervisor, if not a manager. So it's either going to be a sergeant or lieutenant. And then that person will do... Uh, what they need to do to forward that information to the appropriate person to get that concern addressed. But if there's a specific concern related to a stop, for example, then that person can call the same number and they can make a personnel complaint. And let's say they were stopped and agreed with, with the reason that they were stopped, maybe they feel that they were racially profiled. Then that person should call, and I would encourage them to call the same number or they can download a complaint form off of our website, culvercitypd.org, and submit a personnel complaint. We're required by law to fully investigate every personnel complaint that we receive. Now, after the passage of Senate Bill 2, we receive these types of personnel complaints, the racial profiling type or any type of bias-based complaint. Once that complaint is received, we do the, the full investigation, we come to findings, but we now are required by law to forward that complaint and investigation to um, the state. And we forward it to a board that was um, assembled by the Peace Officer Standards and Training. And that board reviews every one of those types of complaints, with other complaints, other serious violation type complaints, and they have ability to hold a hearing and possibly decertify that police officer if they feel like the complaint was legitimate. So there's a, there's, a, there's an additional layers of accountability now uh, since the passage of that Senate bill um, to, to address these types of situations. Hi, uh, my name is Gary Zeiss, um, also a Culver City resident. Um, the, one of the things that neither set of neither set of statistics seem to talk about were uh, there are two things. First of all, on the uh, Ripa stops, the location. It's relevant because if you look at the ethnic breakdown, it's not you know Culver City's oddly shaped. You know, it's not like we're a little circle, and the neighborhoods on one side are bordering different communities than the neighborhoods on the other side. Do we know where the locations of these stops have, and is there any sort of correlation? Between that locate the locations and the ethnicities of the people stopped. Question one. I'll finish that because it's they're they're both similar questions. The other question is for the arrests. Do we know anything about organized crime affiliations, i.e., gang or any other organized crime that the arrestees might be involved in? And do we have any statistics on that? Because that might be relevant as to the efficacy of the arrests. Thank you. Um questions and uh, I, I would expect nothing less since you asked such great questions at our last community meeting so thank you um, so in terms of the location of course when we detain somebody um, a, a lot of times most of the times we're writing a report or we're issuing a citation or something is being tracked somehow um, however we don't collect and report that data for WIPA and we don't like have a blotter map that shows for all of our detentions that are happening in this, these parts of the city. Um, it's not a bad idea, and your points are absolutely valid. Um, the only thing I would mention, um, just kind of like again, back to the data that we talked about in the beginning, um, the 
uh, specifically the red light data. That data is collected from all of our red light cameras. Yeah, and so if you think about where those are located, they, they do have a pretty good spread around the city. So, um, but no, I'm, I, we don't have that, that data related to where these stops are happening. But um, in terms of the, um, you know, what types of other organized crime gangs and things of that nature associated with the types of crimes that we see in Culver City, uh, in terms, of, I know there's been a lot of uh, on the news, especially um, stories about organized retail theft. Um, we haven't had a ton of that in Culver City, thank goodness. Uh, knock on wood. Um, for whatever reason, we've just been blessed to not to not have a big issue with that. But in terms of gangs, absolutely, um, uh, gang members are oftentimes involved in especially the violent type crimes that are occurring in Culver City. And I would even say uh, that they're organizing and committing um, property crimes like catalytic converters and things of that nature. We're seeing um, those become more violent with more serious type criminals committing because it's, it's becoming, it has been a, um, a, a lucrative crime to commit and relatively low risk. So we're seeing folks bring guns and things like that to these types of crimes. So we do have issues with gang members and gangs committing crimes in our in our city. Um, you know, we're, we're very close to the areas in which there are gang issues. Again, knock on wood. Thank goodness we don't have a gang problem that resides here in Culver City. Certainly, our surrounding neighborhoods do. So we don't we don't yeah, make that correlation again. Idea, maybe something that we'll look to do in the future. Um, but not right now. Just hold on. Oh, you're good. I'm good. Yes, sir. Uh, I'm Dr. Luther Henderson. And um, first of all, I want to thank you for the presentation. Um, uh, and I listened to the uh, other participants in this in, in this forum. And uh, we have um, you know, the statistics that you have here, um, unless, and I believe some people have pre um, uh, conceptions, uh, you know, especially on this flyer that was uh, distributed as far as three times the stops of black people, 10 times the, the searches, et cetera. Um, you know, statistics are one thing. Mark Twain said there are three types of lies. Oh, there's a lie, there's a damn lie, and there's statistics. And that's quoting Mark Twain. The, the, the question, the question that I have uh, for everyone here is we have statistics of how many stops and everything else, but the, you have to dig down deeper as far as to why. You understand? Why? And one of the things I knew that there was you know, this whole inference that the Culver City Police Department is discriminating against blacks, Hispanics, or whoever is fallacious. And I would urge, excuse me, I would urge everyone to read Thomas Sowell's Discrimination and Disparities, and it may give you some insight on throwing statistics to our police chief and the police chief statistics and the California police chiefs. Uh, you know, uh, this is a book that basically delineates discrimination, what discrimination is, and what disparities are as far as people is concerned. And you'll get a better idea as far as what's going on as far as our police and our economy and everything else. But I would highly recommend everyone to take a, at least read as opposed to having your preconceptions is for, uh, because I know I've been a, uh, a resident of Culver City for over 30 years. And as my friend here said, there's been a difference in the policing of African-Americans and Hispanics, and it's, in, it's been on the improvement side. Uh, the, um, my, other, uh, my other comment is that uh, uh, I think the, uh, uh, the the police department uh, is doing a, uh, uh, a a better job at doing community policing, going out and engaging. So I su I salute you, uh, Chief, 
uh, and the, the department for, for bringing this form form together. But uh, again, uh, I I resent the fact as a black man that uh, somebody's going to try to use statistics to say that uh, this police department and the officers are discriminating against black people. I have had uh, my uh, interactions with police as well. And I know when, um, uh, you know, the, the why, the question why is, if someone is stopped by a police officer, you don't, and this is something my mother told me way back when, you don't say, hey, cop, why are you stopping me? You basically say, uh, officer, uh, 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 may I help you? What can? Uh, why are you? Why are you stopping me? And you 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 exude respect for the officer, and then that will come back. They will react. They are human people, uh, humans as well. They want to go back to their families as well. They have a a target on their backs every time they go out to serve us. So you know, I, I am sick and tired of yeah. There are there. Are, there, every profession has some bad people in it, okay? Okay, I'm a, I'm a, a professor, of, a retired professor uh, in the LA Community College District. The racism, if you really want to deal with racism, you all, is to go into the schools where African Americans and Hispanics are trapped in failing schools and you don't get school choice. Because K through 12, you got, uh, you, uh, they, they, um, they spend, the, Cal the state of California spends $18,000 per, per pupil per year to incarcerate someone in San Quentin in our state uh, prisons. It's $118,000. Now you figure out what's the best, best way as far as uh, uh, our public dollars. And when they come out of high schools, they can't read, write, or do arithmetic. And then when they don't have any marketable skills, all they do is say, ma'am, stick them up, give me your money. And then you wonder why, you wonder why most of black and browns are in the penitentiary. So that's, I'm guessing off my soapbox, but I'm just telling you, you need to have school choice, and parents need to do their jobs. And enough of this nonsense about throwing around statistics. Thank you. Not not your statistics and you know. Thank you, Doctor. Thank you for your for your comments. Um, we appreciate hearing your perspectives. So thank you. And I, you know, for us, it, it comes down to uh, to, to trust. Uh, and I think it's it's our job to every day do everything we can. To earn and maintain that trust for our community. And we're doing that again. We're committed to that and we'll continue to do that. So thank you. Thank you. Um, I'm Jane Leonard. I'm a parks commissioner here in the city and also a 32 year Culver City resident, prior city employee. Um, thank you for the presentation and the information. And also, thank you for everyone who's here, because this really is important information for us to have an opportunity to have questions and have, um, you know, this this sharing of ideas and opinions. I think this is really a, a wonderful thing, and it's one of the things I love about Culver City, certainly. Um, I do have a couple of questions, as usual. Um, uh, first of all, um, you know, looking at things from a parks pers perspective and safety in our parks, are you able to just sort of give, you know, provide a general um, explanation about what types of crimes are committed in our parks that may wind up in a detention or an arrest? I mean, or. or not <laughs> maybe they're absolutely perfect and there's never any crime in our parks our parks are very safe um our parks are very safe and i think you probably know that and in, in, in doing what you do um, uh, and in large part that's um uh, the credit goes to our prcs department who do a phenomenal job in, in um, you know doing what they do um 
it's hard to say. I, I do know that, um, you know, at night, sometimes we'll have some issues um, with folks uh, loitering and drinking, that type of very minor stuff in the park. We haven't had any really serious type crime. Again, keep knock on wood for a long time. And that, and, and when I first started, we did. Yeah. Um, and that has changed. Mm -hmm. And again, I think it's in large part due to the good work of, of our PRCS department and others. And we, we really make a concerted effort to, to pay close attention to our parks. Um, we've had, um, you know, some um, ongoing um, just issues, uh, uh, I guess, with um, uh, unhoused type stuff. Um, but that's, you know, throughout the city, um, and um, oftentimes that doesn't result in an arrest necessarily, but a call for service, and we come out and we always take a service first approach when we get those types of calls. But again, I think um, we're very lucky to have really safe um, and well-maintained parks with, with great programming here in Culver City, and I think that's part of the reason why folks love to live and visit here. Okay, thank you. Um, what is a consensual encounter? So a consensual encounter, I'm talking about the difference between a detention and a consensual encounter. Uh, start with detention. So um, when we talk about, uh, we talk about detentions a lot. That's what these numbers are, the people, the folks that we detain. A detention can look like a lot of different things. We get a radio call of somebody breaking into a car. We get there in time. We see them breaking into the car. We, we jump out of our car and then we detain that person. We order them to stop, they stop, and we place them in handcuffs and we end up arresting them. So we first detain them and then we do some investigating and then arrest them. Detention can also be, uh, maybe the suspect has left. But we have a description of them and our officers driving around the area and they see somebody that matches the description. Again, they order them to stop, they stop, and they're now detained. We get out of our car, we investigate, to uh, figure out whether or not they're the suspect and either place them under arrest or let them go if they're not the suspect. So that's a detention. So whether or not we arrest the person, let them go, that still generates the rip up for them. Okay. So a consensual encounter is actually uh, anytime a police officer engages in a casual conversation with somebody. And that can be in line at Starbucks. Um, or it can be more investigate, investigative on the officer's side. So let's say, for example, we know that we're having an issue with uh, drug dealing in a particular neighborhood. Um, and we um, see somebody walking in the neighborhood that we believe um, possibly be associated with the drug dealing that we're seeing in that neighborhood. And we have our specialized unit out there that's watching the neighborhood. Um, but we don't have enough suspicion to detain that person. There might be a time when we decide to, hey, let's just get out and talk to this person and you know, see what's going on and to determine whether or not they are, in fact, involved with this drug activity in the neighborhood. So if we were to do that without having enough cause to detain the person, we need reasonable suspicion to believe somebody's involved with the crime to detain them. We don't have that, but we still think oh, they may be involved in that drug dealing in the neighborhood, and that special unit may decide to do that consensual encounter. They get out of the car. They don't even, in those, during those encounters, we don't have the right, the legal authority to make that person guess or even stay in the same place or do anything. We can leave at any time. Um, it could possibly generate some investigative information uh, you know, related to whatever it is that's going on. Okay, yeah, that's helpful. And it sounds like, too, based on the data that talks about uh, the initiated uh, stops or detentions versus the calls for service, it sounds to me like you are ex <laughs> the police department is extremely present out there, you know, making sure that we are safe. And clearly, you do a really good job of that. The calls for service are a, that smaller percentage of the overall uh, um, that, you know, started from either a detention or resulted in arrest. Um, and that, to me, is really, really telling of the amount of, you know, energy and focus that is put on 
the awareness and the, you know, the, the, the dedication of all of the officers. I personally, whenever I see an officer on the street or in a car or wherever, I always thank them because they're out there, you know, just like with our firefighters too, they're the ones that are out there in, you know, in keeping, you know, keeping us safe and making sure that everybody is, <laughs> you know, in, in line, I guess you could say, but um that that those that statistics specifically really uh, that was very interesting to me that because i'm always thinking oh the pd is always being called and all your all your call all your responses from calls no it's not it's because you are out there and you know what is going on out there and um that that's good and then my only other qu other question was um um are there any particular crimes that are skewed toward female detainees? Well, that's a really good question. I don't, I don't have an answer for you right off the bat. Um, I can just say anecdotally, we get a lot of shoplifters that are um, females. Our, most of our violent crime is committed by uh, males. So the rob robberies, the things that involve weapons and, and assaults and things of that nature. But when you see more of a split, would would be like the, the theft type of crimes. Kelly, go ahead. Oh, um, thank you, um, thank you, Chief Sims. I think you're doing a a really great job. I'm very happy that you are our acting chief. And I'd like to thank the uh, officers that have the willingness to serve our city. Appreciate that much. And I want to probably won't have a question here. Just a lot of thanks. Thank the speakers that have uh, mentioned that they do recognize change. That's very, that gives me some hope because there is a faction out there that will never change just never happens. You know, we always have to complain about the same thing and never recognize progress or change. Um, I've been resident of Culver City since 1983 and um, seen some rough times with the police department. Um, and I can say too that, you know, I've seen a lot of change in the police department's attitude towards everyone. And, um, you know, I want to thank you for that. It's all for the better. Um, the past year or so, I've been in a couple of different states most of the time. And, um, you know, looking at, you know, their rip quality, it's, it's interesting because it's mainly pass throughs that are being stopped. And it's mainly white guys transporting drugs and some trafficking up and down um, highways. Uh, so, um, which is not very interesting, but it's just a difference in, you know, they're coming from California, Arizona, Utah, you know, up and down, transporting guns, money, drugs, meth, fentanyl. Those are the majority of the stops in this one town that I'm in currently right now. So I want to thank you for the job you're doing and, um, Thank you for the progress and thank you to the speakers that have recognized that so much. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. I uh, really appreciate you taking the time to um, to come down to tonight virtually and, 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 um, and speak. Um, I, and I mentioned it earlier and it is important to understand um, that um, Again, we're still trying to understand these numbers and we're committed to analyzing them uh, moving forward and collecting them um, as well, obviously, and um, and pumping out these numbers as we do on a quarterly basis in our um, uh, quarterly report, which you can again find on our website, CoverCityPD.org. So you can track them as we go through the year, as we do, and, and keep an eye on it. And if, again, if you have questions, just give us a call and we'll have that conversation. It is important to know and understand, as I alluded to a little bit earlier, that every community is different. Um, as was mentioned by the last caller, 
I'm reminded of a, a community of very similar size and um, population uh, up north of San Bruno. It's um, again, a city about five square miles, 40,000 residents. It's a bedroom community. And uh, most of the people that live there drive somewhere else for work um, during the day. And so their daytime population um, may be less than their nighttime population. So the dynamics of policing there are very different than the dynamics of policing in Culver City and then, then you know, down the line. You, you know, every, again, every community is different. We're just doing our best as a police department to understand our community, understand our community's needs, and again, meet those community expectations, and we'll continue to do that. Yes, I'm Camille Greenspan. I'm a long-term resident here. I'm looking at all the statistics and all of that. And I think the one thing we need to remember when you pick up that phone and either dial 911 or whatever, it doesn't matter what color you are, what race, you guys are coming out. You don't know what we are. And that's a very valuable thing. I don't think you can put it up there because no one's asking me or looking. And that's what's amazing about the city that you guys are there no matter what it is and anybody in our city can pick up that phone and have you come there so that's a very you can't tell that up there but it's it's definitely a wonderful thing that we have with you all so thank you Thank you, and certainly um, our police officers have a very challenging job that has only gotten more challenging over the last several years, and they have my admiration and support. I also know that I hold them to a very high standard, and we'll continue to do that in our police department. Thank you for your support. Thank you. Good evening. Thank you, um, Captain and the, the police department for your services. I live in the Rancho Higuera Community Neighborhood Association. I'm Beth Lane, and um, I'm glad we did. I attended tonight, like so many others that came out. This was a really interesting thing, and I wanted to know more about the Ripper Report. So I did get a good education tonight. Thank you. Um, I was a little concerned. It's a little uh, not about the report. My comment. It had to do with uh, something I saw as far back as 2015. Uh, it was at the time. Uh, President Barack Obama's uh, 21st century, I guess it was, um, I'm sure some of you are familiar with it or not, but um, I was trying to pull it up. It just basically had to do with the certain tactics of police being our guardians in the community versus our warriors. And this is um, a personal situation that got me looking into that 21st, uh, uh, 21st century uh, police uh, uh, summary that President Obama put out. Because it talked about uh, 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 suggestions and ways that could be better for police departments throughout the nation to be more like guardians in their bias training and things such of that nature. I was wondering if that was something Culver City was looking into doing and keeping the police force in terms of their tactics a little uh, less warrior like, but more guardian uh, with regard to answering the calls of, you know, of this of, of their duty. Um, and that was, I wanted to know, that was 1 question I wanted to know if something like that was already in place in terms of uh, training. Um, I witnessed a situation personally in 2020 where I felt like the interface with the police officer stopping me at the post office mailing a letter was basically a misunderstanding of how the call came in or how he interpreted it when he got it. But when I saw him come up to me and I'm standing there with my bicycle going in to mail a letter, uh, it was just very, it was very disarming to me that if I were, in fact, the person that was on that 911, the person who made the 911 call said basically there was an interaction or a fight between a couple, which was probably at the time, if I recall, uh, a black woman and a black man. I didn't have anyone standing with me or beside me. I was there with my bicycle to mail a letter, but I was stopped because I think from downtown where the farmer's market was to the relationship to the post office, I was the first black woman they saw, perhaps. And uh, I, when they did call me into the police department to listen to the report, I, um, I think it was, I think I wrote a letter to Captain Bixby at the time. And um, I ended up going in and having a one on one at the time with a, another captain. I can't remember his name right now, but it was a good 
conversation about the interface of the police officer who stopped me was more interrogative. He was interrogating me as opposed to using a sign of compassion. If I was in fact a victim being choked by a black male downtown at the farmer's market and had made my way to the post office, I might want my police officer to approach me by saying, are you okay? Were you in an altercation or a fight today, ma'am? Yeah. Are you needing help? Or even if that person was following me and I might still be in danger, I wanted to feel that there was more of a compassionate officer in front of me. Yes. When I did learn of the police call, the 911 call, yeah. I thought if that really did happen, that woman was going to really need someone to be a little more compassionate versus me feeling at the time that did I do something wrong? Yes. <laughs> yeah. Am I about to get arrested because they think I did something wrong? You know, it was a, a feeling of fear. Yeah. Uh, when I was interfaced, when I was having conversation with the police officer who approached me. Yeah. So I was thinking that's something that may not be only for me to have experienced. Three years ago, it was right before the black lives matter. Uh, uh, protests, but it, I, it stuck with me still. Yeah. Even 3 years later that. Of course, perhaps there's some other way of. Uh, yeah, training being a little less uh, warrior like, but more guardian like with regard to. Compassionate interfacing. On, on, on those calls. Thank you. Um, yeah, no, and, then, and let me, let me tell you, as you're speaking, um, I wasn't directly involved with that. But it's ringing bells. And so, um, because it, it, it meant a lot to us for a couple of, and thank you for, for um, taking the time to come in and talk with us and for that grace. Um, because it's through that type of dialogue that we learn. And, um, took it seriously and um, uh, investigated it and looked into it and absolutely had those conversations with the officers involved and, 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 and as a training opportunity. One thing to understand about our police department, this is a trend that we're seeing nationally. We're very young, we're very young. The job of a, of a police officer, as I mentioned earlier, is extraordinarily challenging and younger than we've ever been as an organization. Now, there's a lot of challenges that come with that, but the positive thing is, is we have a lot of extremely talented people. They need guidance and they need help, just like all of us. We're always learning. And so we learned a lot from that uh, situation. Because of that and other dynamics, and certainly we've, we're well aware of the 21st century policing model, and we've implemented all of the pillars and um, believe deeply in it and um, have committed ourselves to training. Um, uh, implicit bias training, procedural justice training, constitutional policing training. In fact, um, thanks to um, our elected officials, we received additional funding was back to uh, implement um, above and beyond the uh, state mandated level of training for those topics, the implicit bias and so forth. We also, with the same funding, implemented a very robust de-escalation training within our organization. What we're really doing with all of that training is we're changing culture. And it, it, took, it took and it continues to take a lot of time, energy, effort. We're committed to it and we're continuing to do it. And the training was a big part of that. So as we move away from that uh, and continue to move away from that warrior mentality, Zach Guardian mentality, I think we've come a long way but certainly there's still, there's still room to grow. Um, it, it's, um, it's really, and we've seen it. Now we may have a standoff that lasts an hour and a half or longer as in years past, but had a use of force. Um, people are injured and, you know, God knows what happens. Um, it ends quicker, but the outcome is much worse. We'd rather take the time, slow everything down, Consider what our resources are um, and, and work through dialogue to bring that situation to a peaceful ending. And that's where that de-escalation training comes in. So we're 100% committed to everything that you said. And again, I just want to thank you for taking the time to come in and really be a part of your police department because that's what you were doing. You were being a part of your community. We're a part of your community. We you know what your experiences are with us. Um, and you shared that and we learned from it. So thank you. Good. I'm, I'm so glad. So, 
Thank you. I'm glad to hear that and because it's it's kind of brought it all in, into a resolution for me now that I know that. So thank you. Um, Carrie Sykes again. I have a follow on to your statement and to your question, Jane, about consensual stops. Um, when that happens, is the person stopped aware that it's a con made aware that it's a consensual stop? Is there some sort of formal statement that says you don't have to speak to us? You know, we'd like to talk to you, but you don't have to speak to us. You're under no obligation. Because my gut feeling is, and this comes from way back when I was in my teens and got pulled over. You, know, you see a police officer coming up at you, you get scared. Yeah. And, and I'm a white guy. You know, I had no reason to be scared because of race, but I imagine a person of color is going to be even more scared because of what's going on in this country. Um, and it'd probably be good to let people know that this is consensual, that I not, I'm not here to arrest you. I'm not here to force you to say anything. I want to have a conversation with you because there's some stuff I need to know. If you don't want to, you're free to walk away. Yeah. So um, the short answer is um, no. And we're under no legal obligation to tell someone that they're free to leave at any time. Your, your assertions are absolutely correct. Um, that I, I think most people probably feel like if the police are talking to them, that they need to stay and talk to the police. I will tell you that consensual encounters is something that we um, did a lot more of years ago. We do very few nowadays. It's and it's when we do it because it is still a tool in our toolbox, so to speak, to do our best to keep our community safe. It's for those really rare and unique situations that I kind of described earlier. Um, you know, we're focused on. Uh, as I alluded to earlier with the, when I spoke about the um, directive, we're focused on the serious stuff. We have enough of that to keep us busy. Let's go into our neighborhoods and do what we can to stop these catalytic converter thefts. We had you know, a young girl that was followed in Lindbergh Park. Let's go over there and see if we can find the car that followed her, you know, things of that nature. Let's do that versus the other stuff. of a microphone. Um, my question has to do also with racism. I'm wondering, I guess we could take 2022. Uh, how many complaints were made by pu the public uh, on the basis of racism? And how many of those complaints were upheld? How many victims were paid by Culver City? Victims. How many victims were paid by Culver City? Um, how many lawsuits were filed against Culver City for racism, and what were the results? And how many police officers were disciplined, and why, and uh, what was their discipline? That's, that's some of my questions. No, I appreciate it, and thank you. Um, as far as the, so let me talk about the, um, the um, discrimination and bias type complaints that you mentioned earlier, how many that we had in 2022. In 2022, we had five um, complaints that were related to um, racial profiling, essentially. Every single one of those went through the process that I described earlier, um, were thoroughly investigated, and referred it to the um, uh, the SB2 board, if you will, that was um, recently formed in Sacramento under post um, and are being reviewed if they haven't already been reviewed. I think most, if not um, all of them have already been reviewed. Um, and to my knowledge, uh, we have not received any notification that there was an issue with any of those investigations or complaints. Sorry, what's an SB2 board? So I mentioned it earlier. So. Um, uh, in, do we know what year that, that Senate bill passed? Years ago. Yeah, Senate bill. Yeah, Senate bill two. Yeah, thank you. In terms of, oh, I'm sorry, my apologies. Yeah, Senate bill two. So in terms of the, uh, the claims, I don't have that information right now and I don't want to misspeak. So, um, you can email me if you'd like, and we can get back to you with that information. Quite frankly, I would have to consult with the city attorney's office to even ensure that, that the that the information is 100% accurate, so you could even address the question to them if you'd like. Um, but I'm I'm happy to to facilitate that and get back to you on with those numbers. Okay, thank you. When I was uh, when I was on the city council, I was on from um, uh, 2002 to 2010 for eight years uh, as a council member and a mayor, um, and I remember that there were some cases. 
uh, like what I had just asked questions about. So I know it was happening and, you know, I just wanted to know what was happening more recently. So thank you for that. Absolutely. Um, so I've been listening and I'm kind of curious. I've heard you say multiple times of not having biases and stuff like that. So I'm very curious of why you guys would not have had the state's data up here. Um, statistics are statistics and we do follow them. So as a community, we should have all the information, correct? So I was very curious on why you wouldn't have that to prevent your own biases, right? Um, because the numbers that you guys will show would have probably some slight biases. Um, so I'm very curious on why you wouldn't have put, put the, uh, for your community, um, especially because, like you said, you, you want to be transparent and stuff like that. So that would be another thing. Also, um, the red light um, violations with through the cameras, um, I am curious, was that also for the red lights outside of the is the data also like outside of Core City with those cameras? Because um, I know that there are definitely certain demographics that have a lot more cameras than other demographics. Um, so I'm kind of curious on how that data was picked up when it comes to to that. Um, also, um, since we're talking about reading books, <laughs> um, there is a definitely a great book that many can read, um, which is Breaking Rank um, that has someone who is an officer right here in California. So definitely recommend people reading that book too. Um, but those are basically my main questions um, because it does, oh, and then my other question was also, how do you guys know pretty much where your officers are patrolling through different demographics? Because that would also affect the data. If more officers are in certain Places where there's more Hispanics, they're going to have more stops, clearly, right? So I just want to know those things. No, thank you. Good questions. Um, start off with uh, the red light stuff. So um, we have uh, um, intersections throughout Culver City, from one end of the city to the next, all throughout. You've seen them, I'm sure, in the signs. Hope we haven't gotten a ticket. <laughs> um, and so those are the cameras that we utilize to collect the data just from within Culver City. So not outside of Culver City at all. It's just who's driving through Culver City um, and through those cameras that are within the city boundaries. Uh, and then in terms of the state report, um, again, we, we looked at the state report. It's a compilation of the entire state versus, you know, focused on Culver City as much as we want to be. Also, the state report is, oh, those are 2021 numbers. And our report is a 2022 report. The, the, the state is, you know, they do their best, but um, it's, I guess, efficient in, in collecting and reporting these numbers as we are. It's a lot of numbers that they have to um, deal with. So um, that was that was part of the reason why we didn't include it. It was nothing intentional. We're, you know, we know those, it's public information. It's out there for anybody to, to view and compare to what we have that so but if we want to continue to the conversation we're happy to do that again we've, we've talked about it we can get to on a phone call next week if you'd like come down to the department we'll meet somebody else somewhere else we'll continue the conversation about the numbers the state numbers and so forth and the districts yes thank you so the biggest thing that we consider when we're placing our officers in different areas of the city, and I'm just talking about the patrol officers that answer the, the calls, is response time. And so we value response time here in Culver City. We're proud to say that we have an extraordinary response time, um, 3.30 or so, 3.45 for emergency calls. Very proud of that. Um, so we divided the city up into five sections. And we require that our officers stay in their assigned area. So we assign, we have it, we have during the day at least yeah, every, an officer in each one of those sections so that they, and the main reason is so they can quickly respond to a call in their area. You can imagine if all of our officers are on one side of the city, somebody mentioned before, Culver City is very oddly shaped. 
it's very long from east to west. And so that would take a very long time for our officers to get to a call at Costco, for example, if they're at Washington, La Cienega. So we work really hard to ensure that our officers are spread out through the city throughout the day. Now, of course, that varies depending upon the activity in the city and officers need assistance from other officers, but for the most part, we try to spread our officers out into those five different districts. Hi, it's getting late, so I have a really quick question and thank you one and all for the all the questions and all the information. Um, my question is this up there. Those charts indicate black, white, Asian, other. But we have such diversity here in the city. My own DNA came back mixed race. My son is mixed race. My own brother who allegedly came from the same mother and the same father has been classified um, at times is belonging to a different race. So how difficult is it for an officer to determine when somebody stopped and they have to put in the information what race they are? It can be challenging for sure. And again, I, I started out by saying it's not an exact science. And I'll just reiterate that. Um, you know, it's it's essentially just you look at somebody, what do you think? You know, based on your first blush, your, your first um, Impression. It's perceived, and I think everybody understands that, and the, the RIPA rules state that. It's the officer, you know, consider uh, features of the individual and what you perceive them to be. Certainly, there's a margin of error, and, um, and I think everybody understands that. Um, but we're just doing the best that we can to abide by, and all we can do is do what, the best we can to abide by the state rules. We're with them. We're doing that. We have accountability measures in place so far as actually viewing stops that our officers are making to ensure that we agree with what they're classifying individuals as. And that's all we can do. Thank you. I just have one comment just, you know, for the people in the room and people listening online. Um, the city across all city departments is um, engaged in race and equity training. There, uh, the, the city uh, joined into a group called GARE, the Government Alliance for Race and Equity, a number of years ago. And when I was um, in the transportation department, I was part of the team. And the police department had multiple members on that team, fire, works city attorney's office, city manager's office, transportation, parks and rec, um, every single department was involved in this team. And the, the in, intention of the city to be involved was to um, develop a plan for training and for uh, having city employees across the board understand bias and these issues that, that, that come up. So we are in a time when our city has embraced this understanding that we all have bias and that we need to try to understand it and understand each other better so we can have better conversations like we're having tonight. So that, that's happening citywide. And so if you encounter you know, anyone in the city across the board, they should already have, or they're in the process of being trained and understanding about those kinds of things so that we can, I, I really appreciated what you said about your, your experience um, and how vulnerable you were and sharing that with us tonight. Thank you for that. Um, you know, being more compassionate with each other, all of us in this community, <laughs> can use some a little bit more compassion with each other rather than battling and acting as if we are warriors against each other because this is a this is a time we are a very critical point in our community where we need to have conversations like we are not try to change each other's minds but to understand each other and i think that's where we can come to consensus on issues and have better understanding so thank you Thank you very much. Hello, my name is Tashana Prudent, and I think that this conversation uh, opens many doors. But I think that just as much as you guys take are taking accountability for 
the wrongdoings prior and how we want to be better moving forward. I think that as a community, it's important for us to also do that. And we all have to acknowledge and understand that though this does look terrible, I'm not gonna say that it doesn't, um, on a chart, we do have to recognize that there are bad things that happen and they are happening in every community, in every race, and this is no exception, right? So Culver City is a area that is easily accessed on multiple freeways. It is a, a, a area that does involve, we're not far from the airport. We have a very nice mall here. I, growing up here, worked in the mall, and I remember when there were gang fights in the mall. I remember when they had to lock our stores down when I was managing a store. I remember when, you know, there are a lot of things. Culver City has come a long way, um, a very long way. It is not what it used to be. Is it the best? No. Is it getting there? Yes. And I think that it is important that we as a community and as a people learn to stand with each other, not go against each other, not combat each other as the residents here, because a lot of this is calls that they're getting, which means someone's calling them and saying, the offender is African-American, the offender is Caucasian, the offender is Asian. And then when asked, what that is or who it was or what do they look like, they don't have an answer, okay? So it's important that we all take responsibility for what we're doing, what we're saying, what we're reporting, and what the actual truth is behind the scenario and behind the situation. With that being said, um, I commend you guys for this platform because it's not an easy conversation. It's not easy for you to be transparent, and it's not easy to take what the community has to say, especially when you're trying to make the change. Um, and change is not easy, first, on both sides. It's hard for a community to trust in who represents us at the end of the day, right? So it is a conversation, but it's, a, it's also an action. Right, you're making the change. It's a, it's for us to stand with you in making the change. We can't say make the change and not help in that, and vice versa. So, as a community, we do need to do better with supporting our police station because when you are in trouble, because a Caucasian or an African American or an Asian or anyone else is robbing your house, assaulting your business, assaulting you assaulting your kids. We have kids in school. They don't have the protection that we all feel that they should have, right? You guys are the first, the first people we're going to call. And if we're fighting with you, you can't, in, in earnest, like you can't expect, you give what you get, right? And being in this community for the amount of time that I've been in this community, it is leaps and bounds better than what it was. Amen. Amen. Leaps and bounds. Like, I don't know how many of you, some of you have been residents here for a very long time, but a lot of you, even being the residents here are not ethnic. You don't have that cultural background. So your experience is not gonna be the same as others. And it's important that we respect that on all levels. It's important for us to respect your view and it's important for you to respect Hours. And so with that being said, as a community, this is a great forum. This is a great place to have these conversations and it's great to be open, but in doing so, the best way to get a great result is to not be condescending on either side. It's to be open, to be open-minded and to be truthful in your experience in your experience of what you experience, like we're giving you our synopsis, but I'm curious on, you've served here for a while, you've served here for a while, I'm sure you guys have served here for a while. So in seeing this, I'm curious as to what you've come across, right? What, what, what have you 
your experience? Like, what is a experience that stands out to you? This young lady said that she was, um, she was approached by officers in a in a with a disposition that was unbecoming of that situation. I'm sure you guys have been approached in unbecoming situations. So it's important that we understand that they have a job to do, just like we have a job to do, and. We can't move forward if everybody's trying to do everybody else's job. Thank you, Thank you so much for your comments. They're incredibly valuable. Um, and uh, and we hear you and we appreciate it. So thank you so much. Thank you everybody for coming tonight. Um, I want to again just reiterate the fact that this is an important conversation, as was said by many folks tonight. We take it very seriously, so much so that we've been doing it. Um, since 2020, well before we needed to, and reporting it all to you um, in the spirit of transparency. Uh, and so I, I encourage you all to, uh, if you're if you're interested in learning more about this and continuing to learn about it, uh, please check out our report. We'll put these numbers to the community, citypd.org. Um, and, uh, and, and if you have thoughts, if you have concerns, always give us a call. And we're, we're always going to answer. Again, this is Culver City. We, we live and work in a city where you can call your elected officials and they're going to turn and they'll just call you back. So uh, same goes for the police department. Uh, you have my commitment on that. And you have my commitment, again, that we take this seriously. We hear you. And uh, understand that these folks sitting here and, and I um, we understand the stakes. And if we identify a racist police officer, we are going to be the first people to bounce that person out of our organization because they have no place in law enforcement. And you had my commitment to that. Um, and thank you again for coming tonight. Thank you to everybody that's that's online. Thank you to our elected officials. Thank you to, to our electeds who came as well. Thank you.